the um uh hi there okay so since we're recording i'll say hello and i'm uh, looking forward to people joining us for this conversation about uh, not even fake i think once we get a few people in the room i'll read Beautifully here. I'm seeing Dr. Cora Butler Joe. But uh, yes, I was about to say I read um, that the US Navy released a patent for a theoretical technology to create a field within which objects have no mass and therefore no momentum. And so they could create aerial vehicles that could just do a 90 degree turn at Mach whatever and have no impact on the people piloting the vehicle. And so there's all kind of kind of talk about whether we could. Uh, I just want an anti gravity belt. That's all I'm holding out for. Never mind flying cars. <laughs> um, so uh, welcome, Dr. Cora Jones. It is Jones. I didn't want to presume. Dr. Cora Butler Jones. Awesome. And a holistic health owner. It's very interesting. Uh, I'll just give a couple more minutes. We we've got um, three more panelists are due to join us, and I don't want to exclude them. In the meantime, uh, uh, Dr. Butler-Jones, uh, Cora, if you have any particular questions you'd be interested to throw into the mix, uh, put them in the comments and I'll see if I can feed them into the discussion that we have. And um, what do you reckon, Paul? Should we give them until five minutes after and then, and then we'll, we'll kick off? Any what, sorry? Is there like CGI artists? Like what, what is it exactly? Oh, yeah. Yeah, so um, in January this year, I ran a, a conference for, we had a 1,700 delegates, uh, 67 speakers, 92 sessions over three days, uh, 62 hours of content, which is now on Vimeo, exploring the essence of creativity with the intention of helping people to nurture their creative nature. We had the CEO of a bank, dancers, choreographers, digital artists of various kinds, singers, performers. And the goal was to explore what creativity is and to help people, um, well, to share insights into the creative process so that people can, can see new ways to approach their creativity. So we just today launched uh, a creative community.is, which went live a few hours ago. And it's a, an opportunity for people to join together and share ideas and share work. And it's pretty cool. I write books on, um, uh, a number of different things, but one of the, on futurism, obviously, but also on post-production. And uh, the official book on Adobe Premiere, if you know it, and Audition, those are, those are my books. Uh, Cora, that's a great question. Thank you. Uh, since we're not started yet, I, should, I might as well answer. My understanding of the role of a futurist is to be as accurate as possible in forecasting what and when. So, for example, uh, forecasting the the timing of the transition to cryptocurrencies, the uh, transitions in education systems, uh, transitions in approaches to health and well-being and um, occupations, but also in the development and release of specific new technologies and how those technologies impact our lives. My interest is in the universality of the human condition. So I'm always interested to see ways that technology allows us to fulfill our potential as human beings uh, rather than looking cool and, and selling stuff and being competitive. And I'm a great believer in uh, something that Noam Chomsky said uh, a long time ago, that the, while it's true that we can tend to be competitive with one another and we can that competitiveness can be nurtured, actually it's more fundamental to our nature to collaborate and cooperate. And that's one of the reasons that our media have to work so hard to make us competitive and to be afraid of not being cool enough because we actually tend towards cooperation instead. And so I'm always interested in projects that facilitate us working together. Um, but yeah, a futurist is someone who um, tries to be right in their guesses about the future. Uh, yes, it can be data driven. Yeah, is the prediction data driven? Uh, it it can be, and you know it's one of those principles that the more data you have, the more accurate your predictions can be. But I've also found that um, deepening my understanding of human nature has given me a good 
framework within which I can assess new developments and new potential outcomes and new technologies because uh, the human condition is pretty much universal. Uh, it doesn't matter what your ethnic origin, a smile is a smile. We all love to be loved, we all need to be needed. Um, those are pretty fundamental needs. So uh, yes, the more data, the better. Um, but also there are some fundamentals about, I think about being alive. But what, I mean, you, Paul, you're a, a big data guy, right? What do you think about that? Future uh, predictions? Yeah, I, I think uh, people that, that predict futures have to see the pains of, of the current. So uh, mm. to uh, see the pains of the current, then uh, you have to kind of look at it like everybody's living in their past. And uh, that's, uh, that's where you yeah. get into uh, a failure of, uh, of how society should be. And then if you, uh, if you push forward onto it and actually do something about it, then unfortunately you fall into something called the adventure of the robot. So, so those are the... Yes. Yeah, yeah, which I'm uh, I'm experiencing right now on the Nasdaq. In fact, so um, a couple of people have noted, and I, I've noticed as well, Paul, you're a little bit quiet. Uh, now I recall, no, no, you, we can hear you, but the volume is low. Is that something you're able to change on your system? I hear something. How about now? Seems similar. Do you? Um, I, I could get rid of the headphones and try to extend mic. It, that might work. Let's give it a go. How's that? Is this any better? Uh, maybe. Uh, maybe. Although now I'm no, getting no, an okay, echo. An echo. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay. Let's, let's let's go back let's to the, back headphones. To the headphones and, uh, uh, and we'll we'll, we'll, just, we'll listen. just listen. We'll just listen just carefully. Listen. I'll, I'll just speak louder. So we're. So um, we're uh, actually, I'll, uh, actually, I'll, I'll wait for you to get, to those, get in. those in. I, I, listen, I to listen to my voice enough as it is without, hearing, without it hearing it twice. twice. <laughs> How's that? Any better? Yeah, well, we can, we can hear you. It's not super loud. Okay. Um, uh, maybe I can speak more softly and, and you can ramp it up and aim for the back row. So, uh, so ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us. Um, Charles, welcome. Uh, Cora, welcome. Um, uh, Sarah, welcome. Um, I'm actually really excited to, to have this panel discussion. Uh, we were expecting to have uh, three more panelists um, who I'm, I'm guessing have been held up, but uh, Paul and I will plow ahead with this discussion and Paul's eminently um, well-placed to uh, express opinions about this. And I have a list of really fascinating, um, well, I think they're fascinating, fascinating topics to explore. I was gonna say fascinating questions. Uh, before I kick off, I'll just begin by reading the brief introduction that uh, Frank uh, produced for this panel. He wrote, individually, we interpret data somewhat differently as we attempt to make it meaningful. Too often, we misperceive and so disagree with others' interpretations. Irrespective of cyber wars, how can we remove alarming but innocent false interpretations before they go viral on social media? Would sanitizing media eliminate creativity and thus development? This is certainly a, uh, a complex debate because of course we get into the territory of censorship and from which vantage point shall we censor? It becomes really, uh, really complex. So before I kick off, um, Paul, would you just give us a, just a few moments uh, uh, history for yourself and what your, what your position is on this topic? Yes, um, just a history about myself, investor, uh, inventor and uh, entrepreneur. And uh, I've done all three at the same time and now I focus more on the entrepreneurial side. Um, but uh, you know, on, on what you're saying with the social media, a little tough. Um, I think throughout history, we, we look at censorship through morality. And I think as morality uh, has transitioned and has uh, changed by a, by a certain force, I would say, not really a progression, um, you know, it kind of gets scarier because uh, you give somebody a platform and then say that they cannot speak on a platform after it's monopolized is, is a danger to freedom of speech. Um, so, you know, that's, that's where all the dangers start. And from there, you, you don't know where to go. So I, I mm. think 
censorship, you know, unless it's, you know, God forbid something horrible on the moral side, um, you know, it's, it's kind of dangerous territory to be playing with. Yeah, it's quite frightening, isn't it? I think I, I think I personally tend towards self-censorship where possible, but having worked for 20 years in education, I, uh, I've come to realize that, um, people, you know, the white coat syndrome, right? People do tend to believe things that are uh, said confidently. And unfortunately, um, when you see something in black and white, you tend to think, oh, it must be true because they wrote it. <laughs> um, just to give a, a, a little background on myself, for, uh, at least for the recording for, uh, and for Cora for joining us. Uh, I'm a futurist and a filmmaker and an author. I speak um, at conferences around the world and, and do a lot of mentorship and uh, uh, development work with people. I run the Creativity Conference. Um, I run the Creative Community and write books on post-production and uh, practical philosophy and, and books on futurism. I've worked with IEEE a little bit, uh, IEEE USA, and um, consult for a number of organizations on emerging technologies and emerging, let's say, um, socio-technical landscapes. And so as a media practitioner, I'm particularly interested in the topic we're discussing today. And I think that, um, you know, I have a bunch of questions to throw at you, Paul, and I want to, I want to hear what you think of this. Um, but I suppose my, my position on it is that ultimately the only solution is probably to have uh, some form of objective verification, uh, which I know a lot of platforms are moving towards and experimenting with to a greater or lesser extent. Um, but we we have to accept the reality that people are easily manipulated. Um, now, there are benign ways to manipulate people, which is essentially what education is, although I, I like your comment there, Cora, that education is a system of imposed ignorance, the quote from Noam Chomsky. Um, <laughs> in many cases, that's true. And um, certainly, uh, you know, there, there are a lot of people that, that say that education is is problematic. But there are benign ways to attempt to influence people and less benign ways. And as we've seen from the media coverage of it, things like fake news and also the ways in which people are being manipulated even today as information is being misspread about vaccines and vaccinations. Um, we have this issue that we need to have free speech, but we also need to have verification. That's, that's kind of my summary. But let's start at the beginning. Uh, so here's my first question. The idea of sanitizing media, which is something that Frank mentioned in his description for this discussion, is an uncomfortable one. But is there more that social media platforms can or should do to help to clarify the information that's shared to avoid that misinterpretation? Now, you're, you're dealing with big data. How can you, if you've got an enormous amount of media, enormous amount of posts and comments and shares, how do you find a mechanism for avoiding interpretation or can you of course you can i mean look um, number one i think it starts without central ownership so I, I think that's the main problem um many of these media outlets are all controlled by the same individuals and, and mm. i think uh, <clears throat> i think they're 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 run as press they're run as social media but they just become censorship and i and mm. i cannot agree with that ever Especially as an American, um, and uh, I, I just don't like it. It's not. It's not freedom of speech. There's no freedom of ownership. Um, there should be a manner of uh, either expressing uh, terms and conditions better than 300 pages of contract on a mobile. App, you know. Um, yeah. There, there, there should be a, a priority on on individuals' expression of freedom. Um, of course, you know, not not uh, ignoring morality, but uh, there has to be, you know, a, a way to have a hybrid approach to ownership of, and privacy. That's what I think. That's an interesting challenge, isn't it? Because, uh, you know, naturally, if you introduce things like hate speech or, you know, uh, encouraging people to commit crimes uh, is criminal. And so we have clear rules about that. But when it comes to deliberately uh, conveying information that will be misinterpreted or, or deliberately conveying information to be interpreted in a way that's just shifting people's perceptions a bit, uh, then we don't really have laws to protect people against that the, how, because you could argue that it's a matter of opinion. Although it does seem to me that we, 
we found ourselves culturally in a strange place in which people confuse opinions with facts as if they're somehow equal. And of course, they're completely different things. It's chalk and cheese. They're, they're both valuable and important, but they're not the same thing. And so uh, I'm with you in the free speech thing. I think it's very important that people are free to, uh, to express themselves. And I do think that we've got a, uh, a slight misinterpretation of the concept of causing offense. You know, it's one thing to intend to offend, to intend to cause harm by offending somebody. It's a completely different thing to express yourself in a way that someone finds offense with. Uh, it's the intention, to my mind, makes an important difference. And that can be very hard to uh, police in uh, um, social media platforms where you've got AI reading the thing and hoping to make sense of it. So, so here's my, my next question. Um, and uh, thank you, uh, Cora. Uh, Cora just quoted Noam Chomsky again, if we don't believe in freedom of expression for people we despise, we don't believe in it at all. It's beautifully put. Thank you. And um, I agree wholeheartedly. Uh, but, I, you know, I, perhaps it's a very British thing, but we, we quite like being offended. <laughs> we quite, we, it's kind of a healthy um, part of our culture, I hope. So here's my next question. To what degree are social media platforms responsible for the spread of information? Can they reasonably say, you know, hey, we're just a platform and people post and it's up to them, it's up to people to police it. Or can we reasonably claim, as is gradually starting to happen, that if they have control over what's presented, they are effectively publishers and therefore responsible? Where, where do you stand on that? Um, so I, I think it's, it's not the publishing that's the issue and it's, and it's not the scale. I think it's, it's, the, it's the ownership of the data itself. And I, I think that's where the creation uh, the problem really is created, I think, because they don't give ownership uh, of the data to the actual users, um, they're subject to whatever the biggest investor feels like. So that's, that's really the main issue. I think that's where you, you see uh, Facebook has gone into such an extreme, Twitter as well. Um, it's their right to do whatever they want, don't get me wrong. But mm. once you start silencing people, um, you're you're sending a message. You're sending you're sending a silent message as well with your actions. And uh, I think when when it's supposed to be a, a forum of discussion and universal, you know, humanism, it, it's, mm. it's not going to work out. You know, the the way that humanity works is we all give it a, an opinion or or a, a you know an idea, and we, we let mm. people come back you know, with their freedom of an idea. And if you cannot support that, then, you know, you can't really support the modern world at that point. So where is that going to lead to? We see countries, um, you know, in the East where you don't have freedom of speech. And if we're going to move into that space, it's going to be dangerous territory. I, I think uh, I think it doesn't work out the same way it does, um, especially here in the U.S. where people were misinterpreting finality, I think, and also uh, a, a lot of data just you know, with politics, everything's dirty, um, so you don't want to get involved with it. So I think they should just stay away from politics in general, uh, especially with I don't think they should, they should get their hands dirty into that. Yes, yeah, so, I mean, it's certainly dangerous territory, isn't it? As I, as I mentioned earlier, my, and my tendency is towards self-censorship. I, I believe there are things I just don't want in my psyche, and so I will turn away from them to avoid that being mixed up in my identity and my worldview. But uh, it's, I suppose, you know, I mean, I want to veer a little bit away from uh, the concept of censorship in particular, because the, the subject that, that Frank's posed for us here is more about the interpretation of information and, and the accurate interpretation. Um, but I think that, that we, we have this challenge because it is the interpretation. Everything is always interpretative. And so, uh, you know, Cora just posted there, who is responsible for graffiti? It's a great point, you know. Um, but I do think that the, the social media platforms that are representing uh, information in a specific context, they are the conduit by which people are expressing themselves. And I, I think that it's... Uh, Again, I think that if somebody says something explicitly wicked that is explicitly uh, inciting violence, 
I think that one could argue that there's a problem with that, that, you know, it's inciting a crime is a crime. And so if you said, right, anybody who wears a, a suit jacket and jeans, as I am now, should be killed, then that's a problem, right? But but it becomes much more complex when people are saying things like, uh, goodness, uh, I'm, I'm trying to think of a subject that, like Marmite, right? Should you like Marmite or not? And, you know, here are reasons why you should or shouldn't. When we get into more subtle territory, where people are uh, placing emphasis on particular ideas and under-emphasizing others, we, you know, we were speaking just before we started about the way the media, the, the global media, seems to be exclusively highlighting uh, negative news about the AstraZeneca vaccine, but none of the other vaccines. And as I said earlier, I'm, I'm always suspicious when the global media gets together on anything. I always, I always suspicious, <laughs> suspicious of ulterior motives. So uh, it's curious. And the stories that they're citing are unproven things that ultimately it's resolved. No, that's not an issue. Move on. But uh, it's, uh, it's how we, um, how we present those subtle issues that are an issue. Uh, Cora's just asked for the mic. And just before I, I give Cora the mic, I want to throw the next question in uh, to the pot, which is, uh, is there any meaningful way, because we're talking about interpretation here, is there any meaningful way that society can manage, police, or control false interpretations, the way that people misread things. With that said, uh, let me see if I can click the right button here to give uh, Dr. Cora Butler-Jones the mic as well. I've clicked the button. Let's see if it works. This is my first time chairing a meeting on this platform. and It's not quite the same as handing a microphone to somebody. It's swirling. So while, while hopefully that works, I think maybe you might need to accept um, a pop-up on your screen there. Okay, we have a tick. What do you think, Paul, about society managing people's interpretation? Hello there. Surprise! Okay. <laughs> so I think there is a lot here stated very limitedly. Mm -hmm. And I think you're doing it deliberate. Folks have rights. And we as clinicians, when we approach them, we have them look at their internal selves to emerge the, to, so that the truth might emerge but mm -hmm. it's still their truth and it's tempered by their mental illness or their social yeah. feelings of injustice. But so, even at a broader scale, people have a unique subjective perspective, which is the product of their experience. And they're always going to frame new information in the context of that experience, even if they don't have mental health issues. Well, and, and I would posit that our society is a very sick one. And that's mm -hmm. what we're struggling with. We're, we're not looking at the real truth. We've had truth flung about quite a lot at this particular conference, but mm -hmm. people danced around it because they really can't handle the truth. You and the fact that I know it to be true. <laughs> How easy is it to discuss racism in America? When I oh. travel over in Africa and England and, and to you know various other countries, mm -hmm. even in New Zealand, they have public meetings that are apology meetings in New Zealand with the Māori Indians. Mm -hmm. And it's based on the atrocities the British imposed on them maybe a century ago. Mm -hmm. but here in this country, we can't even have a casual conversation without people wanting to climb the walls of the house to burn it down because their rights were violated. I'm, I'm not mm -hmm. going to go off on that tangent, but... Well, let's stay on truth, topic as much as we can. Is, the truth is the thing. And when you have a society that's sick, and partly made sick by this technology because they've overused it, haven't been policed, no one's helped them shape their direction, their, the morality piece wasn't sprinkled in, their syrup mm -hmm. of, of justice wasn't there. All the sweet things that make us normal and fit weren't imposed. So people just sort of went wild. And now as a result of that behavior, the mm -hmm. outcome is this, this question here. Um, how do we make sure that fake news is not, you know, controlling our society. Well, I think the, the issue that we're looking at is more a little more subtle than that. I think that the 
I, I think that the subject of fake news and the misrepresentation of information intentionally is a major problem, but it's yeah. not exactly the topic of this panel. The topic we're looking at is misinterpretation of the information that's presented by individuals, by groups, by collectives. And obviously there's consequential action from that. Uh, there was a beautiful example I read about years ago. There's a fantastic book written in the 50s mm. by a logician called uh, Robert Tools, I think it was mm -hmm. his name. And it's called Straight and Crooked Thinking. And it's about the ways in which people argue and debate crookedly. And they present false patterns and, and manipulate people. It's a fascinating mm. book. And I think it's in that book he mentions that during the Second World War, for absolutely no reason whatsoever, this, what we would now call a meme, went around that bananas were good. And nobody had any idea why, but they became the most hotly demanded fruit for no reason whatsoever. Nobody knew why bananas were good or whether they were particularly nutritious, but for some reason, everybody decided they wanted one. And this is the sort of unthink that drives a lot of memes. And so, uh, which is you know what Richard Dawkins was talking about when he coined the phrase, that the term meme is that it's a dominant idea that spreads but it often spreads not because it's particularly functional, but because it's effective at being spread. And that's kind of the territory I want to talk about. I want to, to take this question about the responsibility. And again, I, you know, I, I think it may be a bridge too far for the amount of time that we have to explore the challenges mm -hmm. that people with mental health issues face in, in dealing with interpreting uh, information in the media and in, in mm -hmm. complex society. But if we take our obviously non-existent average person there's no such thing really but an average person mm -hmm. and they're looking at media is there anything that society can do and again paul you know you you've been dealing with these big data uh, issues for a long time can society do anything and Corey, i want to hear your view about this as well can society do anything to help people interpret things correctly to interpret them accurately or do we just have to throw our hands up and say good luck I know that that's what we do as psychologists. We spend a huge amount of time trying to impart wisdom uh, using um, cognitive behavioral therapy, dialectical behavior therapy. I'm certified in EMDR. We use all of these skills and techniques to stir the cognitive process to a place of reason and appropriateness mm -hmm. that will put people back on chart so that they're back on course. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of what we're getting at here with media. But what what's implied and not stated is that they're off course. Right. So what you're describing is someone who is burdened by, um, I'm, I'm being lazy with language, but let's say mental health issues of some kind that's mm -hmm. preventing them from responding in, in a common way, in a normal way. Um, but I'm thinking in particular about how people that are not especially burdened by mental health issues mm -hmm who are, let's say, functional in, within society, how they interpret the information presented to them. So, for example, in the UK, there's a recent, I think, a very positive drive in education to um, encouraging children at school to participate in debating societies. Yes. And that means that they're forced to explore, mm -hmm. wait a second, where did that information come from? And how do you know that's true? And yes. And that realization that we have incomplete information, and so it behoves us to be pragmatic and not to, you know, right. storm the walls uh, because we had some because somebody tweeted something, you know. Right. So, right. Um, but again, I'm I'm curious. What do you think, Paul? Do you think that there's, do you think that as a technologist, there's anything that we can do? I'm talking about education. Cora's talking about, um, you know, therapeutic. Um, and, Forgive me if I'm using the wrong word. No, psychiatry, like therapeutic psychiatry, maneuvering their psyche. Right, but what about what about technology? Is there anything we can do as a society without technology? Ooh. I, I, th I think so. I think um, the, the main thing about technology is that it's scalable. So if the intent of the society is uh, is good, and, and not at the mercy of the powers that divide them, you know, if that self-realization comes in into a higher more moral standard than that are being said, then we, we should be able to come up with collaborative social apps like a clubhouse where we could go on and express, you know, um, town hall style meetings with with uh, like minded or even different 
a sort of perspective um, idealist. You know, that's, that's mm. the whole point of, of having a technology. But again, it, it, it's up to leaders first. And if mm. leaders don't stand, then usually society doesn't have a, uh, a chance. So that, that's really what it is. I, I think that's, that's the and Certainly, as I've gotten older and grumpier, I've started blaming governments more for things. <laughs> as I, you realize that, you know, competing corporations have to have a level playing field uh, otherwise, they, they, I mean, in British law, a company director cannot vote for something that would diminish profits for the company within the law. They, they have to ap- operate within the law and maximize profits. So unless governments implement uh, laws that demand specific standards, like, um, you know, removing CFCs from aerosols, you know, companies can only migrate to using non-CFC based aerosols and saving literally all life on Earth because of the ozone layer depletion, uh, even then, when it's literally an existential threat, they can't change the the, um, propellants they use in aerosols until all companies have to do it because it's a loss of profit. But what about AI? Do you think that, do you think that, is there some way? Are they doing it well? But I'm thinking about false interpretation. Let's say, for example, somebody uh, reads something and then they post immediately after that. So they view a post and the thing they post next is a misinterpretation. Yes. And we have an AI spot the incongruity and flag it for the user and say, hey, do you realize what you just posted was wrong? <laughs> is that something that we could do? I think we're moving in that direction. I, I don't believe it, it would be accurate. Um, I, I really don't like the term AI. Um, it, uh, fair, algorithmic al- algorithms. Then can we? It's just, it's just someone else's logic that's being applied. I I, I agree. I agree. So um, a- anytime you have somebody that's designing something, whatever their intent is, is what's going to rule. So I, if somebody wants to go against a certain cause, I think they're gonna they're gonna have the power to do so. Um, mm. I I think that. If you have the ability to to have a, a more, uh, I, I guess, uh, data-driven analysis of what happens after a statement is put out or, or uh, before a statement is put out to see if there's sources that match officially yeah. um, to, to something that could be termed as fake news, that would be a, a more of an accurate thing than stating mm. this is wrong or this is, uh, this is fake news or this is goes against the guidelines. Yeah, I mean, the fake news thing is, is, there's a lot to unpack in the concept of fake news, isn't there? But I'm thinking, let's say, for example, somebody's reporting something they witnessed, and they read an article, they read a story that said, uh, one person was killed. And then they type, uh, you know, a message on their social media that says 10 people were killed. And it's just a typo, right? They just misread it. And, and maybe they typed the wrong thing. Or And if there was a system that could say, I would want to know. I would want a system to flag and say, hey, Maxim, by the way, that number you wrote isn't the right number. You know, I'd want something to correct my interpretation. But I don't know if that's something that that is, you know, the, the, ob- the obvious threat is people intentionally using language that misleads and inflames. And and is and that's dangerous. And it seems to me that education is a good antidote to that. Um, but maybe also culturally, we could we could we could nurture more pragmatism and the recognition that you know, hey, you know what that that really terrifying tweet that I just read. Maybe I should check if there's a you know any other source that backs that up. I don't know. Facebook is trying to do that. I, I was trying to remember. Um, a correction that they had made on something I wrote. And it was just a little, and it really wasn't something I wrote. It was something I, I shared from somebody else's site. I shared a quote that I kind of really liked and the yeah. Facebook police zoomed in and, and um, essentially said it wasn't quite accurate. They were very polite about it and they didn't scold me or anything. They just deleted it. It wasn't political. So I, I don't allow political stuff on my site. Mm, it was mm. some harm. I, I like inspirational quotes. That's mm. why I know who Noam Chomsky is. Yeah. 
Um, and or Alan Watts, maybe. <laughs> I think it's just you and I. <laughs> Get it. But uh, it's really important to note that it, it's a fine line, like you were saying, that do you really want technology to be trying to, with its inability to have a consciousness, reach in right. and, and deal with people who do? And, and that's the real rub. It's an enormous challenge, isn't it? So this brings us back to, we have about five minutes left. Uh, I just got a notification saying, I think we're going to be kicked out. We're going to close out this bar. But uh, the, so what, what do you, you know, what do you both think about, uh, about this idea of self-censorship? You know, do we, do we have responsibility as individuals to manage the information we receive? Now, I, I come from a very permissive society where we're, you know, we're this idea of collecting a lot of information, uh, identifying your sources and mm -hmm. having an opinion about it is part of our culture. Having spent quite a lot of time in the US, I found that um, there's more emphasis on speed of have an opinion quickly mm -hmm. and make sure you've got one. And so I wonder, you know, how responsible can we hold members of society for managing the information they read and, and redistribute? I think that it's an academic kind of view. And because I've taught graduate school and I know that there's systems like turnitin.com that, that do that sort of thing. And mm. because when I've written prolifically anywhere, I always cite my source, I think that it's a good thing. It's sort of creating mm. a data-driven, fact-driven um, society. And on Facebook or anywhere else, it only takes a second to cite your source, which shows that you took time to really look into what you're writing mm. and be thoughtful about it. And mm. we have a site on Facebook that's for doctoral candidates. It's called Finished. And I often will post on their methodology. Uh, there's a methodologist I know on LinkedIn. I will take his his work, Philip Abdu, and post it over on that finish site because for some reason he won't go over there and he's brilliant. Mm. But I put his name and I talk about his books and and I told him, I said, I'm citing you on Facebook, but I'm I'm giving your name to the as the source. And he always thanks me and he's always very polite about it. And I always wonder if he he remembers that that's a part of our responsibility as people at our our academic level to cite our sources to be that example where we're citing the source and not taking credit, even mm -hmm. on a share. You know, but that can be uh, um, that can be difficult, I suppose, on on the, the more casual sharing platforms where it's not mm -hmm. got an academic purpose. It's more just you know. Uh, I don't know. Is but you know we have this joke in the UK that the the government flips a coin to decide from one day to the next whether eggs are good for you or not. You know, it's just like <laughs> <laughs> might not be today. It is tomorrow. It's not. But uh, you know. Um, so here's here's another question then, uh, just to finish off, and uh, and uh, I want to hear what you what you both have to say about this. Is there a way that we can encourage? creative self-expression so people can express who they are in the world express their opinions not attacking somebody not inciting crime but just here's my opinion on this subject while also um, so enabling that facilitating that while also protecting individual safety is there a way that we can manage that or not uh, paul you go first uh, i think the, the only way and it's the oldest way so I'll, i'm sorry i'm gonna I'm going to quote Jesus Christ is to love thy neighbor. And uh, I think if kindness. you have that intent to love, some, to love somebody, then you're yeah. not going to be able to let them uh, be wrong or be right. And, and mm. I think that's the only way to do it. That's beautifully put. Thank you. Yeah, I think uh, I think kindness is a critical component for us getting into a new golden age. You know, it's very important for us to put the needs of the other before uh, the needs of ourselves. But, uh, and, and, uh, I hope you don't mind me calling you, Cora. Perhaps I should call you Dr. Butler-Jones. Oh, what, what do you I, think? I just think that that's sort of the underpinning of uh, much of what I've been trying to say. Mm -hmm. That if, if you're a reasonable person and your thought process is clear and normal, then mm -hmm. you can indulge in that kind of discourse without uh, a censor. Mm 
or a monitor or an AI to come in and swoop down and, and fix what you just put out there that's wrong. Because mm. even if it's something that's stated wrongly by a sensible person who has a kind heart and good intentions, it's going to be very different than uh, a person who has significant anger, frustration, or mm. uh, discouragement, or they live or they're very isolated, socially isolated. Mm. So there's a lot of unhealthy that's not quite mental health issue, mm. but pervasive in our society. And a lot of the folks who are on media are on it because they don't have those normal um, forums for social discourse. So they're mm. hiding behind.